Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome. Welcome to this uh, plenary session this morning. My name is Rob Carpenter. I'm the president of the New Zealand Society of Anaesthetists. Uh, and I'd like to thank the ASA and the conference organisers uh, for giving me the honour of chairing this session. In the second half of yesterday afternoon, I attended a session in this room uh, entitled Research, Art and Science. Our two, our two speakers this morning spoke at that session yesterday, and I can confidently, confidently predict uh, that we are in for a real treat. Now, before I introduce them, I, I should talk about questions. Um, this is a plenary session, and normally plenary sessions are formal and uh, didactic with no opportunity for questions or interactions. Uh, however, I know our speakers uh, enjoy that interaction, uh, and we have a system in place through uh, uh, the electronic media uh, to enable questions to be submitted uh, inobtrusively. So if you have questions, uh, could I ask you to use your phones or your tablets uh, to submit them through the conference app, uh, and I will pick them up on the, um, on the tablet, and if there is time, uh, I will submit them to the, to the speakers. Uh, Tony Quayle is Professor of Anaesthesia and Intensive Care in Newcastle, New South Wales. He did his medical training in Sydney, his anaesthetic training in Newcastle, he completed a research doctorate in medicine in human physiology, which included time in China, uh, studying acupuncture and traditional Chinese, me Chinese medicine. He spent time at Oxford University in the UK. He came back to the Baker Medical Research Institute in Melbourne. Since 1986, he has been in Newcastle as senior lecturer and then associate professor in human physiology before accepting the chair of anesthesia. His research interests include integrated cardiovascular and respiratory control mechanisms and how anaesthesia affects these. Today he's going to talk to us about asthma syndromes in anaesthesia, integration of control systems regulating bronchial blood flow and calibre. Tony. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Mark and Paul, for inviting me to come and share some of my work with you today and, and my collaborators. Um, Mike talked yesterday about the importance of integrated physiology uh, and the understanding of it uh, in the, our practice of anaesthesia. And I hope today to convince you that um, it's important to try and marry the two areas and, and having close, <clears throat> excuse me, close ties with basic sciences are important for our, the future of our discipline. So today I'd like to share with you some of the uh, research that we've done looking at control of bronchial blood flow and airways. And um, as you know, the management of patients with background asthma continues to provide us with a challenge most days in the operating theatre. And although we've got, you know, better drugs and better preventative techniques, um, we still have crises, life-threatening crises occurring. So an understanding of control systems is important, uh, not only from the physiological point of view, but also from the way we practise. And really, the interaction of anaesthetics and these control mechanisms is still poorly understood. And it's been a, a, an interest of mine, as Rob pointed out. So we developed a model, or a couple of models, to try and get a handle on the way the integrated control systems worked in the airway and in its blood supply. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. I don't have to tell this audience that, you know, over 2.2 million Australians have asthma and 300 million people wor worldwide. Its prevalence is uh, about 7% in the US, but it's much higher in Australia for reasons we don't fully understand. 16% of kids, 12% of adults, boys more than girls up until adolescence, and then women more than men. 
It's more common in our indigenous population, particularly in adults. And most people have an allergic sensitization. There's often a history of atopy. Um, asthma deaths occur in all age groups, but of course, if you're elderly, there's a higher risk. And it's implicated in about one in 250 deaths and 318 people died in 2005, which were the latest figures I could find. The really scary bit is when we get that bronchospastic episode under anaesthesia, um, and the asthmatic is at higher risk of perioperative morbidity and mortality, despite our improvements in therapies. The incidence of interoperative bronchospasm actually is pretty low, it's, a, it's a, about 1.7%, but the complications are more frequent in older patients, particularly if they've got asthma. And in the closed database uh, information, about 90% of the closed claims involve severe brain injury or death. So if it happens, you can have a terrible outcome. It's most likely to occur at induction. Um, it's an uncommon but potentially devastating complication. And of course, there are lots of different settings listed there where it can happen, you know. It, patients are often poorly optimised. Uh, it is readily precipitated during instrumentation. Um, certain drugs complicate it, aspiration, infection and trauma all interacting with a hyperreactive bronchi bronchial tree can precipitate se severe bronchospasm. And it can also happen in, in the perioperative per period during emergence. Um, the risks are exacerbated if you've got coexisting COPD, and of course children pose their own problems. Asthma, this is the classic kind of linkage between the triggers, the hyper-responsiveness, and what happens when you get obstruction, increased peak inspiratory pressures, decreased tidal volume and wheezing. Sometimes, if it's severe, as you know, you can pick up the bag and try and ventilate the patient and you feel as though you're squeezing against a brick wall. So it can be a, a really threatening and uh, uh, an event that you'd rather avoid. Now when you look at the triggering factors here, there are <clears throat> lots of native triggering factors, particularly exercise, increased secretions, and the nervous system, which is often forgotten when you're thinking about why bronchospasm occurs. The usual um, Suspects, pollen, dust, tobacco, cold air. And we'll come back to this in a moment. And of course, there's a whole variety of drugs and allergic other allergies, such as anaphylaxis. Now, <clears throat> exercise-induced asthma may affect some people in this audience. It's a... a uh, thought to be in about, occur in about 10% of the population and about 50% of elite athletes. Now there are two theories. It, it usually happens, can happen during exercise, but it often comes on at the end of exercise when you're recovering. And there are two main theories um, as to why it happens. There's a McFadden thermal hypothesis of cooling and warming of the airway and the Anderson osmotic hypothesis, and it's outlined in the next slide, because they've now combined the two. Get water loss from evaporation when exercising, and with the thermal hypothesis, you get cooling, vasoconstriction, followed by reactive hyperemia and engorgement, and then vascular leakage and edema, leading to bronchoconstriction, and the other theory is dehydration 
increased concentration of electrolytes, osmolality, triggering mediators with smooth muscle contraction and bronchoconstriction. So these two theories were actually uh, quite competitive. So Sandy Anderson and Kiplan and others argued that it was the, not the thermal cooling, it was the osmotic hypothesis and so on. But now they've, they've kind of made peace and combined the two. And I'll be talking about exercise-induced asthma a bit later. The one thing that's been kind of neglected in the, the asthma story is the nervous system. And that's what I want to talk about today, the role of the autonomic nervous system. And when we set out on this journey, the control mechanisms in the airway were, were more or less summarised by Barnes in 1997 in this way, that there were adrenergic influences, but as you know, in the human, sympathetic fibres don't actually innovate the, the airway directly. And that's why uh, you see here that it's the adrenal medulla that's being innovated, but, and that's epinephrine which circulates, can act on beta receptors in the smooth muscle. Sympathetic nervous system can also impact on the ganglia, the parasympathetic ganglia, because here's the vagus uh, containing efferents. There are beta receptors in the, in alpha and beta receptors in the ganglia, but acetylcholine is released from the vagus onto muscarinic receptors on the smooth muscle, and that's thought to be bronchoconstrictive. And of course, the sensory nerves the non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic NANC fibres, as they're called, also have an impact through axonal reflexes. So all these peptides, substance P, neurokinin, CGRP, can be released as an axonal effect onto the smooth muscle, also invoking bronchoconstriction or bronchodilatation. So this was the sort of normal <clears throat> excuse me, normal mechanisms controlling airway calibre when we set out on the journey. Now I'm going to talk to you first about the bronchial circulation. This is just a, a diagram showing you that it's a branch of the systemic circulation coming off the aorta in most cases, but it can come off other areas. It provides nutrition and humidification to the airway wall, and also it supplies the, the epithelium and, and uh, smooth muscle. So when we're thinking about what happens in bronchoconstriction or bronchodilatation in you, you and I as an integrated being, you have to think about the blood supply, nerve supply, smooth muscle, and the lining. So the other thing is that it's uh, got a very vascular supply which perforates the uh, both sides of the smooth muscle and the drainage is complicated. The venous drainage goes to both the right and left side of the heart and also uh, to pulmonary arteries and is thought to communicate with the pulmonary circulation. So we needed an awake model to try and uh, sort out the control systems in the bronchial circulation. We wanted to avoid anaesthesia because, as we all know, it probably compounds all the control systems. We had to develop a method of measuring bronchial blood flow with and without blocking agents. And we wanted to study behaviour. And so we started with a canine model. And this shows you the, the organisation of the bronchial circulation in the uh, dog. And you can see that we mounted a lightweight pulse Doppler flow probe on the bronchoesophageal artery. Now the bronchial artery comes off the fifth intercostal artery here in the dog runs under here and supplies the, the bronchial tree. 
Now the, the Doppler that we built in the lab was lightweight, it's built out of silastic, and it's put around the, the bronchial artery and it grows in over a couple of weeks so that the cross-sectional area is fixed. And it's measuring velocity, of course. Now this is just to show you, we, we, the first thing we did was try and work out the autonomic efferents. So we blocked with propranolol, phentolamine, and metscopolamine to block beta, alpha, adrenergic receptors and muscarinic receptors. You can see here, here's pressure, flow, bronchial conductance and heart rate. So propranolol had very little effect. There was a slight effect when we blocked the um, alpha receptors, so the conductance went up. And, but the main effect was with the uh, metscopolamine that blocked the muscarinic receptors, telling us that most of the control was coming from the vagus. And this is shown schematically here. If we inject acetylcholine, here's bronchial conductance, we can get a six-fold increase in bronchial blood flow. So it's got great dilator capacity. If we totally autonomically block the animal, as I showed you in the previous slide, most of it's colon acceptor, and a little of it is adrenoceptor. So the conductance goes up about, it can actually double with total autonomic block. Also, if we block nitric oxide, the conductance will fall. So there's a nitric oxide component involved as well. So the bronchial blood supply is under control of the, mainly of the cholinergic system at rest, but there's also a, a, an alpha component as well in the ratio of three to one. Now, if we, this is a dog lying quietly, a, a dog lying quietly that's been totally autonomically blocked. And I'm showing it to you, oops, showing it to you because, um, just to show your behavior. Here's aortic pressure, bronchial conductance, which is just the inverse of resistance. Physiologists love conductance. Um, venous pressure, bronchial blood flow and the mean flow and heart rate. Now you'll notice here the dog's just lying there quietly like your dog in front of the fire and takes a big breath in. Here you'll notice that when your dog's lying quietly there, every now and again they'll take a big breath and look at what happens to bronchial conductance here. It basically goes up twofold. Here's the bronchial blood flow. So behaviour has an incredible impact on the control systems, but this doesn't have any autonomic control on it. This is another mechanism. And it's probably related to that axon reflex with the substance P and the CGRP and BIP. We're not sure at this stage. So <clears throat> we, we sort of worked out the autonomic control of the bronchial circulation and found these behavioral effects which were really uh, impressive, but we then took the next step to change species. And we did this for the, a couple of reasons. One was uh, we were collaborating with some people at UC Davis in California, and we, there's a, a very smart bioengineer there. We wanted to look at the bronchial dimensions. And so we, we asked him if he'd developed for us an ultrasonic system to measure the cross-sectional uh, area of the bronchus because we wanted to study it in an awake, instrumented, healthy animal. So we switched to the sheep. There was another reason for doing that because the sheep has a single bronchial artery that comes from the aorta. Now this, is, um, this was a sort of arrangement. Now I just want to tell you a little bit about the system that we developed. This is uh, the uh, left main bronchus supplying the, the left side of the, the, the lung. And here we have three crystals. There are two crystals mounted on either side of the bronchus and one 
in between. The two ultrasonic crystals, one emits a, a pulse of 2.3 megahertz, and we measure the transit time around the bronchus. So by measuring the transit time, if the bronchus changes in dimension, because the ultrasound doesn't go through air, it goes around the wall, we can measure whether the bronchus is dilating or constricting. So we set out to prove whether this system would work. And the other thing is that there's a single crystal here for measuring the thickness of the bronchus. So it emits a sound, emits 20 megahertz sound, which won't go any further. Once it gets to the air mucosal interface, it's reflected back. So th both crystals are, are pulsing. One's measuring the thickness, the other's measuring the transit time. So this is what the system we had built. And we wanted to measure bronchial blood flow, wall thickness, and circumference, all in an integrated sense. It's the first time it's been done. This just shows you the, the setup. We tested it with methacholine to see what would happen to the, the bronchus. Here we inject methacholine. This is the hemi circumference. And as we increase the dose, you can see that the bronchial circumference went down. So that gave us confidence that the system was working because methacholine is a known bronchoconstrictor. I'll just try and show you a little more proof. Here's epinephrine. You can see here aortic pressure, bronchial blood flow, wall thickness, circumference and heart rate. It's two doses of adrenaline. You can see that the circumference goes up, so it's dilating, and the wall thins. And the same thing happens with the higher dose. This is what happens when uh, you apply positive pressure ventilation to the system. Here the ventilator's turned off. Again, this is the circumference of the bronchus and thickness and aortic pressure. The ventilator's turned off. Oop, I'll just move my hand, sorry. Um, the thickness, you can see it's pulsatile. So it's actually measuring little pulsations in the, in the wall. It's unfiltered. Then we put the ventilator back on and you can see that you're stretching, stretching the circumference. So this is giving us great confidence of the fidelity of this system. And this is just a, oh, sorry. This is just a fast paper part of this to show you that it's all unfiltered, but as the, it, as the circumference increases, the bronchus thins. So it seems to be following what we'd expect. In the next slide, I'm gonna show you the effect of PEEP on the bronchus. Here you can see PEEP goes on, 10 of PEEP, and venous pressure goes up. Bronchial blood flow, which is here, it's being measured at the same time, it drops. So every time you rack up your PEEP on a patient, you're affecting the bronchial blood flow. You can see that the circumference of the bronchus increases, as you would expect and the wall thins a little. Oops, sorry. So you can see that um, the system is doing what we it would expect it to do. So we were confident that we could now th then go on and look at it in exercise. So in the sheep, we did the same autonomic blockade find out uh, what the capacity of the, the uh, bronchial blood flow was and conductance. And it went up sixfold with acetylcholine, just like the dog, and had a little more alpha-beta effect in it than the dog. So there were slight differences. This is just to show you some behavior behavioural effects in the quietly standing sheep. Here we've got, again, pressure 
blood flow, bronchial wall thickness and circumference. And this is the right atrial pressure and heart rate. Here the sheep's bleating. So it's like you or I talking through closed cords when the sheep bleats. It's creating a positive pressure. So you can see that with that bleat, the circumference goes up here. And these, when, this is when the sheep's taking breaths in and it bleats again. And here again is the sigh, just like the dog. Again, you can see but in this case, we're looking at the circumference of the bronchus. You can see that the bronchus actually gets stretched by the negative intrathoracic pressure. So what about exercise-induced asthma or bronchospasm? As I said, 10% of the population suffer from exercise-induced asthma. It's a 10% reduction in peak expiratory flow or FEV1. That's the definition associated with or after exercise. Uh, in competitive athletes, it's up to 50% suffer from it. And this is some data from Sandy Anderson showing that what should happen when you exercise, they measured peak expiratory flow, is that in man, the theory is that it should bronchodilate. You should bronchodilate. And then, of course, what happens as you recover in the asthmatic, the exercise-induced asthma, you get a fall in peak expiratory flow. And in exercise stress testing, this is when you often see ST depression. What happens in the sheep? We put sheep on treadmills, and they'll actually run for two to four minutes on a treadmill for you. And we did it at different speeds. And here's a trace showing, again, aortic pressure, bronchial blood flow and conductance, circumference and wall thickness and heart rate. This is the resting control showing you the fidelity of the signals. As the sheep exercises, pressure goes up, bronchial blood flow goes down. This is the mean signal here, the average signal mean pressure, mean flow, and the conductance goes down. So in other words, the bronchial circulation is constricting. That should aid the airway. The airway circumference also goes down here, and the wall thin thickens here. So if you think about the airway, the the bronchus is constricting and the wall's getting thicker, which is going to impact on airflow. And the heart rate goes up. Now, when we look at, sorry, this hasn't projected so well, but when you look at bronchial blood flow conductance here, bronchial circumference and wall thickness, this is from four sheep undergoing strenuous exercise for two minutes. The intact, autonomically intact sheep are the ones with the closed circles. The open circles are following cholinergic blockade. You can see that the bed constricts and then during recovery it comes back when the sheep has its nerves intact. With muscarinic blockade there's a constriction and the dilatation is gone. As far as the airway caliber is concerned, again, block it with, uh, during exercise when it's intact, it constricts, so we get bronchoconstriction. The wall doesn't, thickness doesn't change much, but with blockade, the uh, airway dilates at rest, and then if anything goes up a little, during exercise, but the wall thickness doesn't change. So from this data, we conclude that the rapid onset sustained bronchial bronchovascular constriction is the primary airway response to exercise 
in the left main bronchus in the sheep, and that both colonoceptors, and I haven't shown you the adrenoceptor work, but the colonoceptors are involved. These airways are, responses are exactly opposite to what you see in humans. So the, we never saw um, bronchodilatation in these exercising sheep. So it's opposite to what you see in man, and thus raised vagal activity dominates the exercise-induced bronchovascular and airway wall constriction in airways during and after exercise. So what about the effects of anaesthesia on airway dimensions? So we have the model, we know the autonomic controls, we've seen what behaviour and exercise do to the airways, what about anaesthetics? Well, the bronchodilator properties of volatile anaesthetic agents have been recognised for many years, and I don't have to tell this audience about that, but the comparative effects are conflicting. Um, Desflurane was thought to be bronchoconstrictive and that it had a dose-dependent effect. So we set out to, to actually find out whether this was true with this model. So the aim was to study three volatile, modern volatile agents and see if they produce differential effects on bronchial dimensions and bronchial blood flow in the instrumented sheep. What did I do there? I'm trying to get it to change. It won't change. Thanks. So the null hypothesis was that the three agents would be the same. Okay. So we, we looked at um, eight marine AUs. We anesthetised them with propofol and isoflurane, implanted the instrumentation bronchial blood flow, put a transducer on the bronchial artery. In the sheep, it's a single artery coming off the aorta, going to the lingular lobe. So we'd moved down now to the third generation bronchus. We were on the left main before. And again, mounted the dimension crystals and the thickness crystal in the same configuration as the previous model. We had arterial and venous catheters inserted via the uh, cervical vessels for measuring pressure and infusing drugs. And we, they recovered for 14 days. We then took control measurements with the sheep standing. We then anesthetised them with propofol, intubated them. And we'd known from control experiments that we had to wait at least half an hour for the propofol to wear off before they were up and standing. So we waited an hour. And then they were given isoflurane, superflurane or desflurane, and we gave them one, one and a half and two MAC concentrations and followed the, um, the hemodynamics and the bronchial dimensions. The agent day and MAC order were randomised and the measurements were made with the during spontaneous breathing, intermittent positive pressure, and during 40 seconds of apnea to see what would happen when the wall was relaxed. Each agent was studied on a separate day, followed by a few days of recovery, and the data were analysed using repeated measures. And this is just a, a trace from a single sheep showing you one and a half MAC, the, the effect of one and a half MAC isoflurane. In the left panel, oh, sorry. Here we've got aortic pressure, venous pressure, TTS, which is the, the wall uh, hemi circumference, single crystal for the thickness and heart rate. And the time base is shown here. This is spontaneous ventilation, 
And you can see when the, the animal's awake, there's more variability as you would expect. <coughs> Excuse me. Following uh, induction, intubation, waiting an hour, in this case, we gave one and a half MAC isoflurane. So this is after one hour stabilization, positive pressure ventilation, followed by apnea. You can see the, the wall actually moving in and out here. But the, the, uh, the thing to note is the bronchodilatation here. So it, when the sheep's awake, the hemicircumference is about 10 millimetres. And here, it's gone up to probably uh, 12 or 13. With apnea, you can see the, the effect of the agent on the, on the wall in the absence of the positive pressure, of course. So it's giving you the resting tone in the, in the bronchial wall. And again, it's higher than the awake state. And you can see here, the wall is thinned. So the next slide shows what happens when we pull the eight animals. The left panel's got isoflurane, sevaflurane, desflurane. I'm just showing you the thickness, the, uh, the dimensions. That's the hemicircumference, aortic pressure and heart rate. And you can see here the left symbol is the awake uh, hemicircumference. This is control, spontaneous ventilation, apnea, and positive pressure ventilation. You can see in every case with isoflurane, the bronchus is dilated. Same with sevoflurane, whether you're breathing spontaneously, positive pressure, or uh, apnea and the same with desflurane. So what did we conclude? There's a significant increase in airway dimensions with all three agents above one MAC. I've only shown you one and a half because of the time constraints. The increases for control were all similar. 125, 123, 121%. And there was no difference between agents in the effect on the bronchus. The effects weren't dose dependent. So whether we use one MAC, one and a half or two, all the bronchodilatation had occurred that was going to occur. There were no differences during spontaneous respiration versus positive pressure or apnea and there were no dose-dependent effects on heart rate or mean arterial pressure, which I haven't shown you. So what are the conclusions? There's no evidence of bronchoconstriction with desflurane, at least in this model, at least in the situation that we used it. The three volatile agents were produced similar bronchodilator effects. And the interesting thing is that it's not dose-dependent above one MAC. So just summarising the data, the AIDA instrument that we developed to measure bronchial dimensions looks as though it has great potential for now going on to look at other agents and to try and work out when the bronchodilatation actually happens. It's a valuable technique for studying basic mechanisms and effects. The three volatile agents certainly produce equal bronchodilator effects at the same MAC, but this needs more investigation because we still don't know when the, what the threshold is. So it raises the possibility that maybe we can use sub-MAC concentrations for treating bronchospasm. I know there's always a tendency, you know, more is better, but perhaps uh, when we get into those difficult situations in, OR, in the OR or the emergency room or the ICU, then we can use 
sub-MAC concentrations, which has great advantages. So this has great potential. We still don't know what the underlying mechanisms of bronchospasm are associated with GA, general anaesthesia. Is it vagal, reflex, mechanical, local? We really don't know. So that's the future. Thank you for your attention.